Hi there, Glocal citizens. Welcome back to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around manifesting a new world. I am your host, Florence Adu. This week, we have part two of my conversation with Dorika Blackman. She is co-founder and president of the Inclusion Design Group, where she is also head trainer and responsible for the creation of the dynamic set of workshops and follow-up activities used by her team. Her experiential training models cut through diversity fatigue and allow participants to engage in deep, authentic, and meaningful dialogues. Among her prior positions, she served as the Assistant Vice Provost, Associate Dean, and Director of the Diversity and First Generation Office at Stanford University, where she introduced groundbreaking work on authentic engagement, intergroup dialogue, and unconscious bias to over 30,000 students, staff, faculty, and alumni. She also taught several courses at Stanford, including intergroup communication with renowned cultural psychologist, Hazel Marcus. For over 25 years, she has consulted with a wide variety of corporate, educational, nonprofit, and community-based groups to facilitate uncommon conversations on issues of race, gender, class, and social justice. So we pick up our conversation with Dorika telling us more about her work internationally and global speaking. So let me ask in preparation for my global speed question, tell us a little bit more about what your experience has been internationally. So you have a lot of U.S. focus and you, you know, obviously George Floyd was very U.S. centric and U.S. focused, but there were ripple effects and the whole world was watching. So how, what has your work been like globally? You mentioned traveling to Singapore and across the world. Tell us more about your your international works. It's on a couple fronts because, yes, we teach about race and, yes, there was, you know, the biggest civil rights movement in or social justice movement in history in the U.S. And it Mm -hmm. was supported all over the world. So, yes, we teach about that. But in order for people to understand systems of oppression and practices of inclusion, we have to relate it to something in their local context. So we do both. So, for Mm -hmm. instance, uh, the first time I spoke in Dublin, Ireland, the I love I love. Dublin. I love Irish folks that I've met so far. And they were like, oh, we don't have racism here. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Now I know that, you know, I've traveled enough. To be like, okay. <laughs> right. so I went out that night and I had a Nigerian cab driver okay. and I asked him, is there racism in Dublin? And he laughed and he told me, okay, here's where you can't live. Here's where you can't get a job. Here's where you like to get harassed. I got all these people here who have PhDs, doctorates, their medical doctors, all this stuff. And they drive cabs. Right. Mm. Because opportunities go to local folks. And we call that likely bias. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I went back the next day with his picture. He said I could. And I was like, boom, I've been here for one night and I can tell you about racism in Dublin. And you lived here your whole life. Why is that? And I said, it's because I asked. Mm -hmm. I asked the local community about it. And if you don't have relationships with those communities, you don't know. So that's one level. The other level is that I never introduce myself without saying my pronouns. Maybe I did today. I'm Dorika Blackman. I use she and they pronouns. I can't believe it. I never introduce myself. And people get uncomfortable. Clients get uncomfortable when I do that in Singapore because they're not having that conversation. But Mm. if I'm asking people to practice allyship around race issues or gender issues when I'm not in the room, right, then I have to do that. And I just do it regardless. And there's, you know, there's some controversy about me using they, them pronouns and being cisgendered. Or, you know, you're going to get canceled if you're doing good work. Right. Mm-hmm, and I'm, mm-hmm, I'm mm-hmm. I'll talk to you about that. You're going to get canceled if you're doing good work. But if you really are doing good work, then you keep going after you mm-hmm. get canceled. And that's the difference. Um, right. And so I talk about all kinds of issues. I talk about gender, cisgender issues across the world because everybody believes in that. Everybody believes that women get sexually harassed. But like I had to translate when I was in Singapore, they were like, race is not a thing here. And I was like, "Mm, uh, skin whitening is a thirty four billion dollar industry. And every society that I've learned of in the world has a hierarchy where lighter skin is better. Yeah. Yeah. Get quiet. Yeah. They're in denial. Right. Well, I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just people haven't been taught to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to translate things into a local context, because, you know, when we were doing group comm and we made an Asian group, the Asian folks came back and they were like, "Uh, we need three groups. We need an East Asian group, a South Asian group and a Southeast Asian group. And I was like, you can't have three groups, but you can have some breakout conversations within it. Um, but it was educating for me. Yeah. Everywhere yeah. I go, I learn because that's the kind of organization we run. 
And I was like, dang. And but then as soon as they did that, you know, the black folks started talking about the diaspora and the Latinx parts were like, you think Spain, Colombia and Mexico need to be in the same group that you don't know much about. And I was like, I feel that. I feel that. Right, 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 right. It's so dynamic. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, so yeah, these are conversations that I think the U.S. has obviously been at the fore of of starting them, and and I feel like I'm I'm happy that there are people on outside of the U.S. that are trying to have the conversation and really start to you know address it in their own cultures because. It's true. We have people immigrating throughout the world. We have things like Brexit. We have things like refugees being sent to Rwanda. We have all of these things that are indicative of a lack of inclusion and diversity around the world. So, so yeah, thank you for the work that you're doing. So yeah. this, this brings me to my global speed question. So you've traveled, you do a lot of work in the space. We want to hear what you hear. So I ask you to share a word, a phrase, or a saying that is a meaningful part of your local experience and how you've come to value it as global speak. Mm-hmm. So one thing I didn't realize when I moved to the Virgin Islands is that there, while they used to have before the hurricanes, which created an incredible amount of damage here, more of a tourist industry. And now that cruise ships are coming, they're coming back. I tell people when they come to visit me that most of what you're going to experience here is being in the water, on the water, or next to the water, Mm -hmm. right? Because that's the place where this area shines. This is, for some reason, some physical reason, it's like the best place, one of the best places for sailing in the world. So people come here from all over to do that. There's an island right across from us, St. John, that is like, um, like I don't know, 70% nature preserve. So there's a lot of that here. But trying to explain what it's like here, people are always assuming that I got like the best fish and the best produce. And I'm like, we have to fly all the produce right. in because one of the things that St. Thomas is known for is the nickname of this place is the rock because mm. there are two things going on here, Rocky Mountains and beach. Right. Mm -hmm. So as far as like flat land with vegetation and farms and like that's not happening here. And so I think the rock is actually a really apt name for a number of reasons. The other thing is that there's so many people from different islands here. So people want to ask me a lot about what's the like local food. And there is some, but that's not, this is, this is kind of more like a melting pot a la like Miami or New York or something that Mm. people are here from, you know, all over the place, Dominica, which is not Dominican Republic, which I learned a lot about, you know, there were so many, you know, mainland ignorance that I had here when I first moved here, St. Lucia's and kids, people are from a lot of places here. And um, also it's very multiracial. There are white families that have been here for generations. Mm. And that's something that they have the Frenchies, um, which is a community here that has it's some mixed race, but also has a large, you know, French component. Right. And so it's it's a really interesting multicultural dynamic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then there's the Bay, right? <laughs> which, you know, uh, I think my favorite thing, again, is the name that people call Oakland the town. The town. Um, and so they call San Francisco the city, but they mm-hmm. call Oakland the town. And. There's so much pride in distinguishing themselves from from San Francisco as the city. And like they talk about town business. Right. And like there is, you know, being from Detroit, there's like swag. Right. I hella love hella. I hella love Oakland. We swag out in here. And it's just. You know, the Bay is, you know, an incredible mix of diversity, but really strong influence of Black culture, but not just, you know, like what people think of as hip hop. It's art. It's jazz. It's like all of the thing, like visual art is such a big part of that community and poetry. Like, you know, my daughter was an international spoken word poet, but like that's a big part of the community. So I love the artistic focus of the Bay, but I also love the swag. So nice. Let's ride the whip. <laughs> nice. So we have you went from the town to the rock. I did. I did. <laughs> well, and in fact, from the Motor City, because okay. I've been talking about Detroit all day. Like Detroit right. is the heart of who I am. So right. I went from the Motor City to the town to the rock. Um, and so yeah, Detroit is is the, the heart, the center of who I am. And one thing I'll say about that is that the Detroit you have seen. And the Oakland you have seen, yeah, 
is not has nothing to do with the reality of Detroit. And there is a profiteering that mm-hmm. is involved in the marketing of Detroit around crime and fear. And that is because Detroit was one of the most powerful black cities, had the most black home ownership, mm-hmm. had black mayors, black superintendents, black doctors, black dentists. It had a black elite. Right. Mm. Going back to Motown because Mm. black people couldn't stay in resorts. So their resorts were in Michigan. Right. Mm. They didn't have fancy things because Mm. so Motown and then also the auto industry certainly brought all of this stuff. Right. Um, But what people don't realize is I went to a school with four thousand gifted and talented students and 80 percent of them were black. Wow. So when I got into the world and people had these stereotypes of black people, I was like, wow, people are really ignorant. You know, they would say yeah. things like black people don't ski. And I'm like, black, I'm from Michigan. Black people have ski clubs. You know, right. like these are things we have more coastline than California. People swim, right? And, right. You know, right. and uh, right. but it was just there was for me nothing that black people don't do. And it was just ridiculous to say black people don't. Now we do have some things we do and things <laughs> like okay, I'll say this last thing. My cousin got a golf scholarship to college in 1985. His sister play the violin. Like these are not the stories that people tell about Detroit Mm -hmm. and it's Mm -hmm. infuriating to Mm -hmm. people. And not that it should just be middle or high income stories, but those are the stories that are missing, right? These neighborhoods with mansions in them. You've never seen that. You've never seen a picture of Detroit neighborhoods with mansions in them. Yeah, true. Right. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Most recently we've just seen where rock bottom prices in neighborhoods Mm -hmm. that are are quote unquote dying. And so Mm -hmm. I think you, you bring a a whole new, like I can say that I also have friends and people that I've met as a young adult that grew up in Detroit, similar backgrounds to you where it's like, wow, I never knew that. So, Mm -hmm. so thank you for that. We, we, I'm going to put a little link in the show notes to the, the Detroit you don't know, because I think that would be something that would be nice to see. (laughs) Okay. So Speaking of people not knowing things, let's let's talk about mindset a little bit. So what is your favorite or an innovative mindset hack? So this is one that you practice or one that you know of or one that you can imagine. Mm-hmm. So shameless self-plug, mm-hmm. our company actually coined a term inclusive mindset, okay. which is the core of our philosophy. Nice. It was inspired in part um, by the, some of the work I did at Stanford and Carol Dweck's work on growth mindset, right? Mm-hmm. So Carol's a professor, professor at Stanford. Mm-hmm. And we looked at all the research and we tried to boil it down to three things that we thought people could remember. So inclusive mindset is be brave, be humble, and be dedicated. Right. Those are the three things. And we talk about first creating spaces that are safe and brave and group calm. When we started doing research, we found that people learn the most when they were the most uncomfortable. Hmm. Right. Especially people with privilege. And so we help people lean into that instead of being afraid of it. And we call that constructive discomfort. So we've been talking about Hmm. that for years, well before this big boom and white fragility and all of those things. We've been talking about it's okay. It's necessary to be uncomfortable to learn. And that requires us to be brave and go into spaces outside our comfort zone, because I like to say the comfort zone is the place where you learn very little. Right. No, mm-hmm. that's not that's not where learning happens. Right. And then being humble actually was inspired that that term was inspired by Dr. Melanie Turvalon out of Oakland and her work on cultural humility. And her work was with medical doctors who couldn't figure out why their patients weren't listening to them. And in her research, she found is because they weren't listening to their patients. Mm-hmm. Right. And they didn't understand the culture of their patients. And so cultural humility is about just understanding that you shouldn't be talking about communities that you're not a member of and telling them what they are, are and aren't should and shouldn't be. Hear me, Dave Chappelle. Right. Like this is not a thing for you to make a consistent comment on. Right. Like why? Why are you spending so much time? You know, and we know we hate it. Right. When if men are mansplaining about women and what they should and shouldn't do, or if, you know, white people are talking about what people color, how they should protest and what we know we hate it. And yet we still, from an intersectionality per- perspective, will say things like, you know, he's positioning queer people as on some level and black people as on some other level as though black people aren't queer or trans mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or as though the trans women who get killed the most aren't black. Right. And it's just ridiculous that he's even talking about it at all. 
right? Um, so there's that. And then being dedicated is about what I said before. You're going to get canceled. You're going to get called out. Mm-hmm. I use they in the pronouns from time to time. And one time in group comm, some of our trans students were like, we hate cis people using they and them pronouns. It's performative wokeness. And I was like, all oh, sad. And then they came to me after class and they were like, oh, we just wanted you to know that you get a pass because you're an educator. And I was thinking to myself, is it laminated? Which <laughs> trans people am I going to go and talk to and be like, oh, no, I have a pass from three trans people that said I can, I can use them. That's not how it works. You're going to get canceled. You're going to get right. questioned. I was saying gender nonconforming like two months ago. And somebody was like, eh, right? Do you say people with disabilities or disabled people? Huge argument in that community about that. Yeah. Right. And it's generational. Right. Which one do you say? Whichever one you say, somebody's not going to like it. Being dedicated is about getting canceled or getting called out and continuing to do the work. It's right. about doing your own education instead of asking other people to educate you who aren't educators. I'm an educator. Ask me. But don't ask just the Black person or the Latinx person or the Native person who works with you to like lead the conversation about their cultural holidays, right? Or the Muslim person, hey, you're Muslim. Do a workshop on Ramadan. That's not how that works. Right. Pay somebody who does education to come in or speak or whatever, or educate yourself and pick a book that you're going to read as a book club. Do something else that doesn't involve more labor for the marginalized community and get involved with organizations, not just individuals. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And especially organizations that educate privileged folks. Right. Because everybody wants a marginalized friend. Mm-hmm. But that's not where the real work is. The work isn't on you finding somebody marginalized to be friends with. The work, and that's the king confusion where people misunderstand his the holding hands. That's not the work. The work is ending racism, right? And changing the minds of people with privilege or not just racism, homophobia, all of the things, right? right? Is, mm-hmm. um, yeah, just ending all of that oppression. There's policies, right? You know, we people are so mad because Everybody unanimously voted for a Juneteenth holiday, but we can't get an anti-lynching bill passed. Mm-hmm. Right? That's why people are mad. Not because Juneteenth is bad, but it's an internal. It's even a question for us. Right. right? Am I going to celebrate the fact that we didn't know we were free? Right. Uh, I don't know. And I celebrate it for a variety of reasons that mostly have to do with the in culture joy that we had because we could find joy even in being told late. Yeah. Right? Like we were like, OK, we still have a party. Yo, this is great. We free. Right. And I love that about us in terms of the resilience. So those are our that's our mindset. Inclusive mindset. Be humble. Be brave. Be I mean, be brave. Be humble. Be dedicated. And it's iterative after you're dedicated. Right. You do your work. Then go to the next level of being brave. Right. 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 Iterative. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the next thought that I had is that, you know, this idea, you know, that you were getting flack for choosing they as one of your pronouns. It's your choice. And so that that you say that you're going to get canceled, I think is a fearlessness and, and everyone probably needs to own that. The, it basically goes back to everyone's not going to like you. But if you love yourself and know yourself and can understand that you are always a work in progress as well, then you probably are in a, a better situation to to move more fluidly in the world. Yes. And you have to do your education with the community because mm-hmm. we do have some folks who don't do the education part and they're just like, this is my choice. Like there's a thing where people introduce their pronouns and then they add nouns like queen and, you know, all kinds of other things. And I'm like, that's because you don't have a relationship with the trans community mm. and you don't know, or a non-binary community, you don't know that this is an act of allyship that we practice because people are oppressed. It's not just an opportunity for you to be creative about how you introduce yourself. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. I don't, you know, I hear you, but it just means you don't have an understanding and you're now doing the thing we hate, which is you're co-opting a thing that is for a community so that it can work for you. So it's a, it's a process. It's, wow. it's, it's art, not a science. Yeah. When you decide something for yourself, and the biggest part is when you get called out to be humble. Right, 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 like, right, right, right. I talked about deafness as a disability one time. That's another thing we work on is neurodivergent. I didn't know I was neurodivergent until I started studying neurodivergence. I was like, oh, I have a diagnosis that falls under that category. But I talked about disability once, and I mentioned deafness, and this woman walked up to me crying. And she said, deafness is not a disability. It's a language difference. 
Mm. And my mind was going, mm, I know a lot of deaf activists who would not agree with you, blah, blah, blah. But my mouth said, thank you for letting me know. Mm. Would you be willing to talk to me about this? And it's OK if you say no, because I'll do my own education. That's the humble part. Mm-hmm. Is when you get called out, shut up and say thank you. <laughs> I mean, mm. you know, mm-hmm. don't don't speak about, you know, well, can you explain that to me? That's not what my friend said, blah, 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 blah. She's in tears. This is emotional intelligence. Right. The humility part is not always we tell people if you give an apology, it's not an admission of guilt. It's an expression of care. Right. Right. Get over the blame and shame thing. We don't do that. We don't teach that. We don't believe in that because it's debilitating. Yeah. Right. If we teach people blame and shame, that's the enemy of any movement for change we're trying to build. Nobody does things. I mean, they might do a little because they feel ashamed. But in the end, that fuel part, they get burnt out really fast. I can't tell you the number of people, white allies especially, who are like, I just, I feel like nothing I do works. And we're like, oh, that's white fragility. But I'm like, when they stop doing things that they have been doing at a high level, that doesn't serve us, right? So I have a particular compassion. I don't I don't do tone policing, so I don't expect everybody to have the compassion. But I have a particular compassion for people who are committed but don't know what to do to make a difference. And I talk to them about continuing after they've been canceled because it's a hard thing to do. Somebody you've been working really hard and somebody tells you you're sexist is hard. Right. To keep going. You're like, I did this and I did that. And we. Sometimes you don't want to hear white people or, you know, I keep talking about the black and white dynamic because it's so prevalent in my day to day. But I do want you to know you don't want to hear, oh, I had a huge argument with people I was close to about neurodivergence and what I was not wasn't going to accept about the way they labeled me. Right. Because there's so many stereotypes. Sure. And these people who are black and queer just went this and did all the things you don't do about telling me about the time, what happened to them when they were kids and da da da, da. And I was like, You're, this, is, this is not what we do. Right. You got to hear me when I'm talking about my own identity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 So tell us, tell us for, for our listeners who don't know, what, what is neurodivergence? Oh, that's a big conversation. It's a newer term. So I think when people talk about people who are quote unquote normal, Mm-hmm. They talked about it as, you know, people with mental health issues, mental disabilities, mental illness, and not everybody, you know, like some people love mental illness, right, as a term. And other people are like, uh, I don't want it to be framed as illness. I want to talk about divergence. There's neurotypical and then there's divergence. So mm-hmm. this is different, not, you know, sick. Mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. what illness mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. And there's a big debate about that. What falls under neurodivergence is a big debate, right? And so, you know, some people argue that certain diagnoses are under it and other people aren't. Some of that is from a research perspective, but it's kind of like BIPOC where people have been talking about POC and then they felt it was a need to dif- differentiate the experiences of people who have been enslaved and who genocide has been perpetrated against. At first, I was like, oh, we don't need more splintering under the POC umbrella. I, I don't really love BIPOC, but I use it out of respect for people who have a good reason for using it. Neurodivergence is kind of like that. It's new-ish and people mm-hmm. are like, you know, what does it mean? I'm not yet prepared to give a like straight definition because it's so new and controversial, but it is about mental health and diagnoses and how Mm -hmm. we name and frame that. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. That I hadn't heard it. So a whole other conversation that is new stuff every day. That's why you're going to get canceled because (laughs) I have these identities and I'm like, Oh, BIPOC, uh, you know, when queer first came out, I started saying that because I'm from, I was living in the Bay. And oh, the first place I said that outside the bay, I got attacked. It oh, was wow. Because it used to be a slur. Sure. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. What a world. What a world. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's take a step outside of the work and mm-hmm. and talk a little bit more about who Dorika is when she's not working and talking mm-hmm. and speaking. So I like to ask the question, are you a reader, a watcher or a listener? And what are some of your favorite reads, watches, or listens? I'm a talker. Which one is that? Um, uh, (laughs) I would say it's really hard for me to answer that because I also think it's an iterative process. I think I can't talk unless I listen. 
So sure. I would say in that way, I'm definitely a listener. Um, I love reading. My two favorite authors are Toni Morrison and Stephen King, and that will actually tell you a whole lot about me mm-hmm. um, in terms of being outside of, of any particular norm. But I'm going to say listener because I talk for a living mm-hmm. and I would not be good at what I do if I hadn't spent a lot of time listening to communities, Mm -hmm. right? I learn because I listen. Mm -hmm. Um, And I find that people quickly jump to the idea of leader without listening. We almost never do a workshop without a Mm pre-survey because I, we talk about our work as ACE, actionable, customized, and experiential. We can't make it customized if we don't know what's real for you and your community. Right. And so I want to hear not just what the person who's hiring us think. I want to hear, I want to hear what the people who are attending the workshop think. Mm-hmm. Right? And I read every single one of those, no matter how long they are. Because I want to know what people are feeling and concerned about and what they already know. So I don't I'm not repetitive. That's super, super important to me. If I'm speaking at a graduation, I will sit with either the students or the the, um, person who's hiring me or both and say, "Okay, talk to me about what's going on in this community. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's just that's just a super important part. And then, like, I like to listen to the quiet. Mm -hmm. I get up at like five in the morning a lot to yeah. watch the sunrise. Yeah. And the sound of quiet yeah. is like, that is the most private Dorica thing in the world. People don't know, like I don't usually listen to music. I never watch television news, not ever, because I don't believe it's news. I believe it's largely repetitive. You're not mm-hmm. going to learn anything new. And it's mostly reactionary. Mm -hmm. Right. Like Mm -hmm. it's all about what they are doing, what they are doing, what they are doing. And my grandmother has dementia and she used to watch MSNBC all day and night. And when I came to live with her for a little while, I just turned it off and we started listening to music, the music that she loves. We listened to uh, Nina Simone and Sweet Honey and the Rock totally changed her experience. Yeah. Yeah. Listening from listening intentionally to that which positively feeds you. Mm -hmm. Um, a huge difference to like what I call listening to the television. Now mm-hmm. I watch messy TV. I don't watch, I don't watch reality TV because it ain't, it also isn't real. Right. Um, but uh, I mean, you know, I used to watch the cooking and, and fashion shows and all that, but I don't even watch that stuff anymore. But I watch, you know, TV that, you know, not everybody, I'm, you know, I'm not perfect. Right. 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 I'm right. Music for sure. If you grew up on hip hop, then you already know you listen to some madness a lot. <laughs> Um, But as I've gotten older and older, um, 50 was an amazing transition for me. Oh, wow. It was, you know, I moved here in the right. I turned 50 in 2020. Okay. Just a madness to turn 50 during the pandemic. It was that's why I quit my job. I was approaching 50. I just knew I needed a radical self-care change. Yeah. And listening to the quiet is meditating and all of that is a really big part of my life. Nice, nice, nice. I too am a quiet connoisseur. So Mm -hmm. yes, I I love this. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I love to listen. Music is something too, but yeah, I'm up the same time and it's quiet time. So I like that. Yeah, great. I love it. I love quiet connoisseur after using that. (laughs) Yeah. So Dorica, this has been so awesome. I feel Mm -hmm. like I could talk to you about this stuff, obviously, because you can talk about it for, for hours and hours, but I want to be respectful of your time and your day. And so before we say adieu for the time being, <laughs> do you have any um, parting words for our audience that you'd like to share? I think the most important thing that I want to say is thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that we spend a lot of time talking about what isn't and what's wrong. And just knowing that there are so many people who are talking about what the solution is, what inspires, what's positive, always gives me strength in the work that I do, always gives me the motivation to talk about the oxygen more because Mm -hmm. I know that gives people fuel. So thank you to you and all your listeners for having something that just 
isn't entirely about the problem. When I was listening and looking at your questions, I was like, yes, right? Like, I'm gonna get to be a person. I'm gonna talk yeah. about culture and, you know, it's beautiful. So Yay. thank you. For Yay. Thank, you and thank you too. Thank you too. All right, listeners, this has been another episode of the podcast. You can catch us each and every Tuesday with new episodes at globalcitizenspod.com or wherever you get your podcast. Write a review, share, check out the show notes. These are going to be really rich show notes, folks, because Dorica has dropped a lot of knowledge in the DEI space and just generally about just activism and everything. So I'm so happy to put these together for you to take a look at. And so as always, until next time, bye for now.